And he was the first one to speculate on whether the Earth might be behaving like a giant cell. Well, look at this. Geometabolism. The Earth is constantly turning herself inside out by bringing magma to the surface through seafloor rifts and volcanoes. And that hardens into crust, which breaks up into tectonic plates that slide under each other in subduction zones so that the magma remelt, the crust melts back into the magma. So you have a deep recycling system from the insides of the earth to the outside of the earth that never ceases. Then on the surface of the earth, you have actually two toroidal weather systems lying on the surface of the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere where the rainforests are keeping the whole system in balance because they take moist ocean air, and they're always in equatorial regions, right? They're Indonesia, South America, and Africa, the big rainforests. They take the warm, moist ocean air, they push it high up into the sky, where it goes in two directions from the equator to the poles, comes down as precipitation. The ocean currents, the solar heat, are all driving this system, and the rainforests are basically pumps in the system. They're not the primary producers of oxygen, contrary to, to popular belief. Plankton on the oceans really are the primary oxygen producers. But the forests, of course, do also generate oxygen, and this is also a kind of metabolic system. So all parts of ecosystems, I believe, are in communion because consciousness is primary, and they metabolically renew themselves and reinvent themselves in response to each other as an entire planetary system. Now, to understand how living systems work in evolution, I want to show you two essential features that are quite simple that I abstracted from observing nature and that are very helpful in understanding how evolution works. One is a simple cycle of evolution that always starts with some unity. Let's say the early Earth was a homogeneous mixture of minerals, and then it individuated, including forming individual bacteria on its surface. Now, whenever you get individuation happening in nature, you get tension and conflict arising. It's absolutely natural. The process of individuation makes different beings that then can come into conflict with each other. But if they don't kill each other off during this phase, they start negotiating their differences. And in the process of negotiating their differences, they can come to some resolutions of these differences and actually set up cooperative schemes. And if this spiral dynamics plays itself out, they can form a unity at a new level. This is a basic maturation cycle. Do you see the, the version of it for an individual, human psychology? Unity individuates. The child is born of the mother. They separate. It becomes an individual. Tension and conflict can get set up between kids and parents, between kids and kids, between kids and society, right? But they learn then to negotiate their way to a mature adulthood and hopefully to a wise elderhood. In the case of the early Earth uh, individuating into the bacteria, you, the bacteria negotiated with each other and eventually evolved the only other cell ever to evolve on this planet, the large nucleated cell. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, and that's the kind that we and, and the larger biological entities are made of. So they formed that new unity at that new level. Now, what's interesting is that everything in our biological world is at some stage of that cycle, but they're not all at the same stage at the same time. So you can find the cooperative species and the competitive species at the same time. Just as in the human world, you, wouldn't have, you, you, you can't have a species in which there are only children or a species in which there are only old people, right? We're all at different stages of maturation. And some people get old in years, but, but don't go through the whole maturation cycle. So we have all these different possibilities to look at. Now, biologists, ecologists recognize two basic types of 
ecosystems, and then they talk about the one in between as a transitional one. In the type one ecosystem, you get species that are taking all the resources they can, multiplying as fast as possible, occupying as much territory as they can in a very competitive mode. Then you find in your type three ecosystem that they are sharing their resources, sharing the territory, and helping to ensure the life of other species because they're way more cooperative and they seem to have figured out that feeding your enemy works better than trying to bump him off. That it is inefficient to keep attacking others instead of negotiating your way to a cooperative situation. Darwin didn't see this in nature. And I think one of the things that held him up the most was that he adopted Malthus's view that populations always outstrip food supplies and therefore nature is an endless struggle in scarcity. In Darwin's day, I'll bet you his family and neighbors were recycling just about everything, but they didn't think of it as recycling. It hadn't been named. It wasn't seen as an essential process of nature to recycle things, right? It's only in this, this modern consumer society that we pile up that much garbage. People didn't used to do that, right, when, when uh, mo most of us were, were little and, and the generations preceding us. Okay, so that one concept is that cycle. The second one is even easier. Holons and holarchy is a concept Arthur Kustler coined to get away from the idea of hierarchy when looking at nature and seeing the embeddedness of living systems. Cells within organs, organ systems, body is one form of holarchy. Here's a single-celled creature. It lives within a multi-celled creature that lives in a local ecosystem, which is part of a larger ecosystem, right? That's a holarchy. Here's a nice toroidal self-organizing storm that lives within a living planet, that lives within a galaxy, another case. So you get the idea. It's the idea of embeddedness in nature with things being part of a larger entity and having smaller entities within these, that kind of layering. Now, three quarters of Earth's life was devoted only to evolving single cells. The bacteria for half its life and the big nucleated cells for another quarter of existence. The archaebacteria, the first children of Earth, uh, for half her life, caused all kinds of crises of hunger, of pollution, and they solved those crises by social maturity and innovative technologies. The hunger crisis came about because they ate up all the free food, the sugars and acids that had been formed on the surface of the earth, and then they had to figure out how to make food, and they did it by harnessing solar energy. They invented photosynthesis. But photosynthesis had a waste gas of oxygen which was a deadly gas piled up in the atmosphere after the ground and the water had soaked up as much as it could, and it was killing off large numbers of other bacteria, so it was a huge pollution crisis. And only when another lifestyle evolved to use the oxygen to uh, make a living, which was the, uh, the third way of making a living, the first ones were fermenters that ate the free food, and then the soda synthesizers, and then the respiring bacteria, the breathers. So I call them the bubblers, the fermenters, right? They make bubbles. The bubblers, the blue-greens that photosynthesize, and the breathers. That makes it easy to remember. Bubblers, blue-greens, and breathers. So each new stage required a new technology to get out of the problem and notice that they're very similar problems to the ones that we are repeating today in creating crises of hunger and pollution. So among the innovative technologies were the harnessing of solar energy. They built nuclear piles, probably to keep warm, by, by consuming uranium and, and dropping it in their nests as they died. You've got uranium streams. Bacteria actually formed continental shelves. They, they changed the whole face of the earth. They collected minerals in their habitats. Uh, that's why we can mine copper today and uranium, things like this. They, they were so vast in numbers and 
lived over such huge periods of time that they actually rearranged the geology of the planet. They also invented the electric motor, which I'll show you in a minute because that one's hard to believe, and created the first World Wide Web. So <laughs> this is really, really interesting, and it made me more and more interested in learning about the ancient bacteria and how they got through the maturity cycle because they're so like us. 